Uh, friends, we're moving into a, a situation of uh, seeing a panel, Journey with People of Other Faiths, and it's my great privilege to introduce at least two of our panelists. Uh, Sean is awaiting the fourth outside, and uh, I'll introduce everyone in any event. So, Dr. Brenda Anderson is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Religious Studies at Luther College here at the University of Regina. She has taught at Luther since 1994. Brenda's research and teaching focus generally on issues of women and sexualities in religion, colonization and decolonization, and violence against women and specifically on Islamic feminism and on the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women. In 2008, she co-chaired an international conference on missing women in Canada and Mexico. She's involved with interreligious dialogue at the national and international levels through the United Church of Canada and the World Council of Churches. Mesa Huck grew up here in Regina, Saskatchewan, and strongly identifies as both Canadian and Muslim. She completed a Bachelor of Arts and Science at McMaster University in Ontario, and is completing her Master's in Religious Studies at the University of Regina, where she has researched Canadian Muslims and sex education. Her academic and activist interests include North American Islam, feminism, and queer inclusive religious movements. She serves as an ally on the board of the UR Pride Center for Sexuality and Gender Diversity. That should read Center for Sexuality and Gender Diversity. And she volunteers with Regina's Multifaith Forum. She's also served as a peer chaplain at Luther College. As a settler on Treaty 4 territory, she was also raised in a loving, affluent, and empowering family. She acknowledges that she has many privileges. Her work stems from the responsibility that comes with these privileges, as well as her interconnected religious beliefs. She also loves cats. <laughs> Hannah Grover, whom, who, uh, who we'll meet in a minute or two, we hope, is a graduate of the University of Regina's English Honors and Creative Writing Program. She currently works as a tutor at the University's Student Success Writing Center and recently finished contract work as a film producer for the UR Pride Center for Sexuality and Gender Diversity. She is a bisexual Jewish woman and activist. When she's not talking about LGBT2SIA+, and Jewish activism, she's also incredibly passionate about independent filmmaking and devising contemporary theater. The intersection of her faith and sexual orientation have always been empowering to her, and she hopes her experience will assist her in her art. As such, she aspires to be ever evolving as she grows, as a woman, as a filmmaker, as a performer, and an activist in her communities. Sean Bell, many of you will know, Sean Bell was born on a small farm in southern Alberta and is a cradle Lutheran. He is married with four children and has been ordained in the ELCIC for 10 years, having served as a pastor in Edson, Alberta and Regina, Saskatchewan. For the past four years, he has been serving as chaplain at Luther College here at the University of Regina. As chaplain, Sean works with a multi-faith group of employed students called peer chaplains. Friends, this is your distinguished panel. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you, Andre. <clears throat> I just want to give a quick special thank you to Brenda, because after uh, when we were talking about presenters and the topics we might like to explore, after I talked to Brian Hillis, Brenda was the second person I talked to, and it was just a, a blessing to discover the giftedness in the community around Luther College. <clears throat> Uh, when this panel uh, was formed, our vision was to explore journeying with people of other faiths, and the questions that they were given were twofold to, to please address. Uh, what does it mean to live as a person of faith in your context? And from your experience, what wisdom do you have regarding journeying with people of other faiths? And I also tried to leave it open to trust them to tell the story that we needed to hear. So this is our distinguished panel. This is our distinguished convention. They're very gifted. I've watched them working for the last couple of days. They do great work. The question I want to leave with you is just as you listen uh, is, uh, what's my next step when I go home in this journey with people of other faiths? And you can absorb that as you listen to your story. Just in order to maximize the panel's uh, storytelling time today, there's not going to be any questions from the floor, but you'll probably be able to bump into them at coffee break. So uh, we'll begin by inviting Brenda, and everyone else will take their turn in turn. Thank you, Paul. Is this working okay for you? Distance and all? So I'd like to begin by acknowledging and noting gratitude that we are meeting on Treaty 4 land and homeland of the Métis, and also of Indigenous peoples who did not forge treaties. So my job in 12 minutes is to give an overall framework for discussing interreligious dialogue. And then from there we have Mesa and hopefully Hannah telling a bit of their stories, their faith journeys. And then Sean is offering one model of interreligious dialogue, which is Luther College's multi-faith peer chaplaincy. In setting up this framework, in such a short amount of time, I'd ask for a little bit of leniency if you find I'm making generalizations or don't offer as many examples or specifics as you'd like. I just want to intend to raise some questions that I think need to be asked when we engage in relationships. And since I'm speaking to a Christian audience today, and some of you will already be involved in interfaith work, uh, while others of you might be interested in, you know, planning an event or initiating a group, I'd invite you to consider three questions. Why do we dialogue? With whom do we dialogue? And how do we dialogue? And when we're thinking about the why, who, and how, keep in mind a further question of how we might journey with people of many faiths within our Canadian secular context. What is the role of religion in the public space. So let's go. Why do we dialogue? What do we want to achieve when we enter into dialogue or relationship? There is no one monolithic way that Christians have defined to work with or even against the religious other. But there are general positions that have been articulated and they've had different consequences historically. So it's helpful to reflect on how we understand those of different faiths in figuring out why we want to dialogue in the first place. The first position is one of exclusivism. So it's not really a dialogue so much as a monologue, right? It's the I'm right, you're wrong stand. And this results in the type of missionary work designed to convert people. The religious other is damned unless we convert them. This is a belief that outside the church there is no salvation. It supports colonialist practices still today. It justifies violence in order to, in the case of Canada, kill the Indian to save the man. And an exclusivist position has obviously been used worldwide as well. We could say that in this model, you can't even tolerate a religious other. Instead, people seek a universal kingdom of God. And Christianity has a long legacy of this attitude, and obviously that's not where you are positioned today. And just to remind you that this isn't a perspective relegated to the past. There are still many Christians, and those of other faiths too, who maintain an exclusivist position to those espousing different beliefs. Hi, Hannah. A second way of viewing the religious other in Christianity could be called inclusivism. 
It's a stand that says, well, you have some validity to your faith, and I'm okay with that. But if you knew better, you'd know that Jesus Christ is the fullest expression of the divinity, and perhaps in time you'll come to see that. This is a little better than exclusivism, right? It's, but it still positions Christianity in a place of judgment and power. It's pretty much a paternalistic pat on the head. It smacks of superiority and it allows Christians the privilege of tolerating the religious other. And I think we can do a little better than just tolerating. Interreligious dialogue that's premised on this kind of belief is little more than window dressing of being nice and typically as little substance because we haven't considered the opportunity for our own transformation in that encounter. Yet another way of viewing the religious other is known as pluralism. There are many paths to the one truth, all have merit, and in fact bear many similarities to one another. Pluralists might go so far as to say that in fact I need the religious other to have a more complete picture of what the world and God is like. So do you notice there's a shift here from sort of a defensiveness or fear to one of curiosity and, and learning, right? Listening. There's also an understanding that others can be different without it meaning there's a judgment on your own faith. So you dialogue with an intention of some deeper understanding for yourself. How we view those of other faiths predicates why we enter into dialogue. And I personally have a bit of a problem with these three ways of viewing the religious other. Because I think that here religions are being imagined as these static, monolithic boxes with tightly drawn lines of difference talking to one another. And the problem is that when we think of religion as a box, we're concerning ourselves with differentiation, boundaries, lines, how the box of Islam is different from the box of Hinduism to that of Buddhism and so on. And I think that in effect we are actually creating the religious other and boxing them and ourselves in by our differences. I think there have been many difficulties with certain models of interreligious dialogue, and it's often because we haven't thought too much about how comfortable we are with difference. So this takes us to our second question of who is invited to the dialogical table? With whom do we dialogue? Typically, in institutional dialogue, one person is designated to speak on behalf of all the people in their boxed-in faith. Now, how is that possible when we know that religions are diverse and humans are diverse? Tell me, how many theologies and opinions are there in this room of just the ELCIC in Canada? And we also... <laughs> but I hear you've done great work this week. <laughs> And we also know that when it comes to institutional practices in interreligious dialogue, politics and tradition play a role in who gets to select the delegates to speak on behalf of a tradition and who gets chosen. So it's not accidental that interreligious dialogue has historically been done by a certain subset of men. Women have traditionally been excluded from formal institutional dialogue. My third question was about the process of dialogue, how we do it. Traditionally, in the inclusivist and pluralist approaches, the process is about delegation and representation. The process is about sharing and learning, and that's admirable and worthy, but it may lack, in my mind, the oomph to radically transform us so that we no longer construct the religious other. I'm not convinced those approaches, even pluralism, is about journeying with people of other faiths so much as it might be about positioning ourselves and our faith. And my experience suggests to me that the process of dialogue in these models actually maintains the boundaries and boxes. So my preference is a model I call dialogical activism. The motivation or why for this type of dialogue is activism. It's to connect and work with like-minded people of faith who seek common goals, justice issues, maybe about poverty, decolonization, misogynistic violence, environmental crisis. We have a lot. The boundaries, creeds, and doctrines drop away as significant definers, not because they're not important to the individuals, but because you've readjusted your reason, the why, for dialogue. You aren't thinking about difference and delegation. You're thinking about need. Some call this diapraxis, 
So some of you might be familiar with that, the dialogue in action. Women using feminist principles have tended to use this model to bring forward the voices of the marginalized and disenfranchised. The process of dialogue depends upon who is invited to the dialogical table and what your motivation is, why you dialogue. The three are intertwined, but I think it's useful to think through those three questions if you're planning to an event or to organize a group. If you dialogue to address a common issue, for instance, LGBTQ2 theology, who you invite is obviously going to be different and the proce process of dialogue is going to be different. It's about enacting justice by listening, and I've heard that that word has been brought up many times in the conference. It's that enacting justice by listening to the voices of the disenfranchised, uh, or in the context of this conference, you might refer to this as reconciliation with people who have been othered or silenced. When marginalized people engage with scripture or rituals or traditions, they move out of the margins and into the center, the whole reason for being church. And my experience, and probably yours, is they bring new understandings and depth to what we know about ourselves. So that's what I have to offer you today, but I want to leave you with the question of, what is the role of religion in the public space? If our why for dialogue is not to proselytize, compare, or judge, if we have inviting people who have not been traditionally included by religion or even in the interreligious context, again, the marginalized and disenfranchised, and if our process is about enacting social justice, social change, perhaps turning the world upside down as scripture tells us to do, does that not mean it is about absolutely essential to hear from people of faith in the polis, the public space, the political? And there is an urgent challenge before us to create those spaces for dialogue and relationship amongst people of many faiths in Canada. So thank you. Hello. Oh, is this good? Good? Okay, excellent. Um, okay, well, so my name is Mesa, and I'm going to talk, I kind of ignored the first half of the prompt, and I'm going to talk a little bit about journeying with people of other faiths um, using a program that I did through the peer chaplaincy this year. Um, okay, is that okay? Closer? Okay, I'm going to stay, stand here. Okay, um, so so I did um, I'll, the program that um, that I ran with with Sean and also Hannah. Hannah was one of my speakers. Um, it was called Querying Faith, um, and I ran it in uh, this academic year. So starting in September, um, ending kind of a couple months ago, um, through my position as a peer chaplain, and it was kind of like a, a regular multi faith discussion group that was aimed at providing LGBTQ plus people or allies um, of faith with a safe space to share and discuss their work, um, stories, and experiences. Um, so a little bit about me first. I am an ally. Um, some people find this confusing that I would you know, do this work but not be a kind of a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but it is in fact possible to be an ally and still do this work. That's what it means uh, to me to be an ally. Um, and I've had a long-standing interest in kind of gender issues, Islamic feminism, and LGBTQ plus affirming or friendly interpretations of Islam, um, which aren't really something that I came across organically growing up uh, as a Muslim in Regina, um, but is kind of something that I came across more in my, my academic life. Um, and so as a teenager, I wasn't really aware that other religious traditions had similar issues or debates uh, going on with, within their communities, which I guess maybe now seems a little bit naive, but it wasn't really something I was thinking about. I was very focused on like some the Muslim issues. Um, but when I moved, uh, I, I moved to Ontario to do my undergrad, and I like the best friend I made, like the first day when we had orientation day on campus, um, was a, a transgender Jewish man who transitioned uh, during our degree together. Um, and so we didn't really talk about matters of faith or religion. We were just like 
best friends, like inseparable. We always came together to everything. Um, but so th just kind of through our normal friendship, I, I realized that, you know, being an ally and having those, those safe spaces for LGBTQ plus people and especially people of faith who don't necessarily find it in other places, um, it became something that I realized just was very important. Um, and so, you know, when I came back to Regina um, in, the, in the summers, I would, you know, think about this and I would, you know, I'd think about like where would, if you were an LGBTQ plus Muslim, where would you go for support? Uh, so, I, so I started asking around, and uh, the answer was pretty much like, there is no one here, and there's no really place that you could go, um, or that you would know about, for, for obviously. Um, so, so I found that to be a little bit problematic, um, but it wasn't really something that I could speak about very openly in, in my mosque community. Um, just, I mean, I, I could have done that, but it, w it wouldn't have gone over well, so I, <laughs> I, so I just didn't. I kind of just kept it within my family and, and friend groups. Um, and, and I found this opportunity at the uh, North American Interfaith uh, Network Connect Conference that Luther College hosted in 2015 um, to kind of talk about these issues. And, and some community members kind of approached me afterwards, and, and they were not Muslim actually, but um, they were kind of people of faith or faith leaders in, in Regina and Saskatchewan. And they kind of approached me saying, you know, we have similar issues in our communities, um, and this is how we deal with them. And that was kind of the first time I realized that I didn't necessarily need to look into the Muslim community for these kind of supports or to create these kind of supports, but that in fact, since we had so many other you know, religious groups and faith groups in the, in, the, in the community, in the city, that you know, I could reach out to them instead and maybe build something that way, uh, which hadn't really occurred to me before. Um, so, so when I moved back um, to Regina to, to do my master's, which I'm so close to being done, um, I learned that uh, Luther College has a peer chaplaincy, a multi-faith peer chaplaincy. Um, and so I, I approached Sean, I just kind of like, I don't know if I harassed him. Did I harass you, Sean? A little bit, okay. <laughs> I, I approached Sean um, and kind of brought up this, this issue, this kind of concern I had about, you know, where I would, uh, LGBTQ Muslims go for support um, since we don't really have that within our community. And so we brainstormed a bit on how some kind of program could be done. And so, you know, based on my experience with Muslim communities, I didn't think that necessarily uh, approaching my mosque would be a good idea. Um, and I was also kind of concerned that if we hosted a group that was just for Muslims and were kind of very loud about advertising it, that there would be some backlash. And also that, you know, youth themselves wouldn't necessarily want to be seen joining such a group because it would, you know, it would out them, it would be very obvious. Um, so we're just kind of looking about how to, how to solve that problem. Um, and I was, another concern I had is that, you know, when, when I had been doing my undergrad in Ontario, um, I had the chance to attend their, their kind of LGBTQ uh, mosques, friendly mosques, so I had attended some of their programming. And even for uh, like a large city like Toronto, there was kind of low attendance. Um, so that's kind of concerned that if, if we started something like this in Regina, it might literally just be, it might be me and Sean. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, would be great. Like, I would love to spend more time with Sean, but it might not be helpful to other people. <laughs> um, and then I was a little bit uh, concerned about kind of community backlash if I, you know, started advertising widely for LGBTQ Muslims in, in the city. So, so I applied for a position at the, cheer, at the peer chaplaincy, um, which I would like to add is, is an amazing opportunity to have as, as a Muslim woman since, you know, chaplaincy, I mean, Muslim chaplaincy is a thing, um, not so much in smaller cities. So it's just, it was really nice to even be afforded that kind of opportunity um, since, you know, it's, it's something that's kind of difficult to come by. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, so I applied and I kind of got this position and we, in, in conversation with Sean, decided that, um, it would be better to, like it made the most sense to run this kind of programming, not specifically for Muslims, but to do it through kind of a multi-faith lens. Um, and it, like honestly, it, it, I guess it was kind of like a, a shift, but once we came up with this idea, it really did make a lot of sense because we already had so many resources in different faith communities. I had these connections with, with friends, um, family, through volunteering with the multi-faith forum from Brenda, so it, it was like a very logical uh, way to do it. Uh, I don't know <laughs> why it didn't uh, kind of occur to me um, earlier. So, so we just, it was very easy to kind of brainstorm this list of speakers, of friends, of professors that, that could speak to these issues. Um, and then I approached UR Pride, which is the Center for G uh, Gender and Sexual Diversity on campus, and they were very interested in partnering with us. 
um, their exec executive director, Jack Brasser, and programming coordinator, um, Kat Haynes, were very um, supportive, and they both have their own kind of respective Catholic and Wicca faith traditions. And so it's also, it's, I think, important to note that um, it's kind of an exceptional thing that in uh, UR Pride, a, a center that uh, deals with support for LGBTQ people, was interested in doing faith-based programming um, because we know that often LGBTQ people face uh, just so much trauma and so many terrible things from, from faith groups um, that there is often a kind of reticence to make these kind of partnerships. Uh, so it really does speak to them that they were so interested. Um, and honestly, the, the kind of push when I, when I told them the idea we had um, to invite uh, speakers from different faith backgrounds. Um, they were the ones that pushed to to say that, you know, if, if we're going to ask people to share their experiences and, and their stories, uh, you have to pay them um, because, you know, LGBTQ plus people often are kind of expected to share their stories and experiences and over and over to educate other people, um, but so often are not kind of compensated in any way, so they pushed very strongly that we have to give honorariums, like we have to recognize people for the time, which was, I think, a very important piece of this program. Um, and so once those pieces kind of fell together, um, the program was, it was, it, it was very like an intuitive program. So uh, the way it ran, we did about, um, and then in first semester I did, I, we tried to do it weekly, and then the second semester I was just a little bit swamped, so it became a more monthly thing. So what I did is I would try to invite um, a speaker every week. Um, they were just given the in instructions that they could come and talk about whatever they wanted uh, for kind of the first half an hour, and then we would have a discussion about it. And I would moderate if necessary, but usually it was very conversational. Um, so just for some context, we had speakers from, um, um, so Sunni Islam, from different faith backgrounds, including Sunni Islam, Progressive Islam, Catholicism, the United Church, uh, Judaism, uh, Wicca, as well as from a liberal Christian, First Nations, and Buddhist background. Um, we also viewed an original play called That Power, which featured the intertwined stories of um, a, great, uh, a gay Christian man and a non-binary uh, Hindu person. And we attended um, some community events, uh, such as a reconciliation panel, um, hosted by the Canadian Roots Exchange, um, a multi-faith potluck hosted by Regina Multi-Faith Forum uh, at Wesley United Church, not too far from here. Um, and so we had kind of speakers, guest speakers from, from all kind of walks of life and from all back, from many different backgrounds. Some, some, were, some were professors, um, some were students, some were activists, some were religious leaders or former religious leaders, um, and some were uh, practitioners. Um, most of these were kind of just local people from Regina, and then there were a couple we Skyped in um, just because they had, we had connections with them, but we, were, we had a, a small budget, so we couldn't fly them. Um, okay, thank you, I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, and so I, this might sound like it was like a very exciting uh, program. I mean, I think it was exciting. I'm very happy we did it. Um, but to be honest, like sometimes our attendance was a little bit low. I don't know if it was ever just me and Sean. I, there was a time when it was just me and Hannah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there was one time where it was just me and Hannah, but we tried again, and we, the second time there was a lot of a larger audience. Um, and so some, sometimes this is a little bit discouraging that it was hard to get people, hard to bring people out because um, maybe it was the topic, or it's, it's really hard to tell uh, what was discouraging people. But I think Brenda, both Brenda and Sean gave me a very insightful comment that even just the fact of having, you know, this advertising or these posters uh, saying that, you know, there's an LGBTQ plus uh, Jewish person that will be discussing these matters of faith, or there's a Muslim who is queer friendly and will be holding a discussion. Just having those posters around the campus uh, might have, you know, been like the first step to creating those sparks in people's minds that, um, not only are there people from different faiths that can discuss these things, but also they can come together, uh, come together across faiths and discuss similar issues. So, so overall, I think that the multi-faith approach, um, it worked very well. We, we were often able to attract participants from, from different faith backgrounds. Um, and some initially came because they just wanted to learn about their own faith. Uh, so the Muslims would come for the Muslim session, but then they'd kind of maybe meet some other people and make those connections and then continue coming to learn about other, um, other faith groups and to hear from other uh, speakers from different backgrounds. Um, and so in this way, uh, participants were able to learn about how various faith traditions deal with LGBTQ affirming theology in some cases, similarly and differently, how some people just don't care about theology and deal more with the, the identity aspect and, and the social aspect, and how, you know, oh, 
that's my timer, and how although <laughs> there, there are many differences, there are also very many similarities. Um, and so a, a Muslim might face very similar issues to, to a Jewish person um, or to um, the, the gay Christian man we saw in, in the play that we viewed together. Um, so just, just a couple last remarks. Um, I think also uh, that maybe one of the reasons why this was a good approach is because Regina is, uh, like it is a smaller city where each faith tradition um, might not have been able to create and sustain a group on, on their own to talk about these issues. Um, and might not have been, not have, as, as kind of was my feeling, might not have uh, felt safe doing, doing so on their own. Um, but there was kind of this, through the multi-faith approach, there was like an aspect of safety and legitimacy in numbers. Um, so if maybe my community would not support me, I had you know, the backing of uh, like the rabbi, Jeremy Parnes was very supportive, um, and Sean and Luther College chaplaincy. So if my community might not have been so into, into what I was doing, there were other communities that, that were supportive of these things. Um, um, and I guess just lastly, my, I, I think I'm very happy about the way the program went, even if it wasn't the most successful in numbers. I think there was good quality, if not quantity. Um, and so, you know, although each faith group uh, may not have been able to organize or sustain such a, such a program or a community individually, uh, by taking this multi-faith approach, uh, approach and, and working together, we were able to, I think, create something that was very, like, unique and also varied, and I would say beautiful. So thank you. I'm a bit tall, so I have to figure this out. This good? Can everyone hear me? Great. So, uh, I'm the bubbling fool that stumbled in a few minutes late, so my apologies for that. Um, first of all, good Shabbos, everyone. As previously mentioned, my name is Hannah Grover. A bit about myself, just to get the ball rolling. I'm 25, a new master's student at Concordia University, bisexual and matrilineally Jewish. I spend a lot of my time thinking about intersectionalities and identities. And I think my lived experiences present a window to open up a dialogue about the intersectionalities of faith in 2019. What does that mean to people? It's common for faith to be everything to some folks. It's their ritual, their source of life and belonging. For others, it's a tool of oppression and harm. For me, I certainly experience a bit of both and like I said, I'm bi, so that's to be expected. Uh, the questions presented to this panel, however, what does it mean to live as a person of faith in your context and from your experience, what wisdom do you have regarding journeying with people of other faiths? Certainly, those aren't questions that are simple for me to, an to answer. It's taken me a long time to think about what I want to say at this panel today, and I couldn't even really think about it until about a week prior to the event. Because for me, being Jewish is a heritage. It's political in a good and powerful way, and it's enriching. My mother tried her best to give me a Jewish upbringing, but as a child of divorce, spending most of my time with my non-Jewish father, it was lacking. At a Brit Mela, which is a naming ceremony, um, a bit later in life than most infants, but other than that, it was never a huge part of my upbringing. My mother and I would celebrate the rare Hanukkah or Passover, Pesach. But as she was reform and the laziest of reform at that, it was informal and never really taught me much about being Jewish and what that should mean for me, a young girl living in Regina, Saskatchewan. It wasn't terribly impactful. Um, but then history in grade six happened and I learned about the Holocaust. My mother talked to me about my grandfather leaving Romania so his family could farm in Canada, but she never said why. Now I knew, and I don't think I'd fear for my life so viscerally as I did that day, I learned about the horrors of Nazi Germany. As a child, knowing that people wanted to destroy people like me or my family in such a horrific way was unfathomable. It still is. I never talked to my mother about it. I never talked to anyone. I put it away. 
As I got older and politics shifted, hinting at the devastating political climate we're in today, my mother told me that I knew I was Jewish, and that's what mattered. Other people didn't need to know anymore. She told me to protect myself, and so I did. All through high school, and most of my bachelor's degree, to be honest. The people who needed to know I was Jewish knew. But I didn't go to temple. I didn't observe holy days. I even occupied an edgy atheist phase in my teen years, complete with the works of Richard Dawkins and seminal groundbreaking work like Bill Maher's Religious. <laughs> so I guess you could say I was quite the 15-year-old intellectual. <laughs> uh, when I turned 23, however, Trump was in office. And in August 2017, the Unite the Right rally happened in Charlottesville, Virginia. I saw men and women marching in the streets in the dead of night with tiki torches to protest the removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee, a Confederate soldier and prolific slave owner. These people unabashedly brandished swastikas and don't tread on us signs, threw up Nazi salutes, and shouted, you will not replace us, which very quickly shifted to Jews will not replace us. While I watched in horror as this unfolded on my computer screen, I felt the immediate urge to go back to Temple and tell everyone I knew I was Jewish and proud of that. At that point in my life, not since the Orlando shooting had I been so terrified to say who I was, but in Regina, Saskatchewan, if there was no representation that I saw, I decided to be it myself. I went back to Beth Jacobs Synagogue, attended Shabbos services every Saturday, I studied Hebrew, and I took on a kosher diet. Of these things that have survived is the kosher diet. <laughs> Um, being Jewish for me is political. People want to hurt me, so I have to defend myself, my people, my heritage every day. The intersections of my Jewish identity are not so much about God and faith, but they are about community. I'm going to Montreal in the fall to begin my master's degree in media studies at Concordia University, and I've already found a reform synagogue there, and the only reform synagogue in Montreal, interestingly enough. Um, it's accepted me with open arms. It embraces two LGBT plus identities as their own rabbi as a lesbian. I've never felt so proud to be Jewish, but there's still a lot of work to do. While I work on my master's, I hope to explore my identity even further to make my faith as intersectional, leftist, Zionist critical, and self-critical and exploratory as I can. What has helped me to do this has been my interactions with folks of other faiths. Um, personally, I want to thank my friend, Brenda Anderson, um, for asking me to join this panel and for being a fantastic mentor in interfaith studies, as she and I have worked on a couple of occasions, including film work with UR Pride, to promote intersectional and interfaith dialogues through academic discussion. But really, for me, interfaith discussion begins with being open-minded. Well, especially in Regina, um, I have faced a large amount of anti-Semitism, not only because there is such a small community here, but the political climate is getting more and more right-winged, racist, and exclusionary. I feel the best way to fight this is with kindness and respect for others. I am grateful to enjoy respectful dialogues, not just with my colleagues, but with many other folks from various religious denominations who are eager to learn about the same things that I am, but at the same time, they're able to enlighten me in things that I was ignorant of. And I know it's not their job to educate me, but open dialogues like this have become increasingly important. I've never been in an interfaith setting that's anything less than welcoming. Heated at times, but never disrespectful. I know my experience is limited, and as I grow with my own religious identity, I hope to be informed of my own biases, my own prejudices, so I can grow to be a more accepting and respectful individual and an informed ally to other religious minorities. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today. I feel very honored to have you listen to my story and to elevate Jewish voices when that seems quite rare right now. Um, so let's keep the discussion going. Thank you very much. It's a scary thing to say, you've got lots of time. Not We're on time, time. <laughs> not that much time. He's got his cards here. I can throw out the first two. 
Uh, hello, my name is Sean Bell. I'm the chaplain here at Luther College and the University of Regina. Uh, I love the second question. What wisdom do you have to share regarding the journey? And I, I so deeply appreciate the, the stories and wisdoms of my, my colleagues here. Uh, I wanted to start by saying living as a salesman is really hard and you enter into many strange relationships. I have a quick confession to make. I sold Kirby vacuum cleaners for one week. I, uh, I took all my powers of charm and used them for evil. In the 1999 movie, The Big Kahuna, Danny DeVito is an older salesman talking to a younger salesman who spends the whole movie, instead of selling auto parts, he's out there trying to convert people to Christ, and Danny DeVito finally sits him down and says, anytime you enter into a conversation with an agenda, it's no longer a conversation. It's just another sales pitch. So when I thought about multi-faith, this is the part of my brain I had to turn off, that part that's like, I better get my words out. I better say what I need to say. I better be right and have all the right words and have all the right wisdom. But I've turned that part of my brain off and just be a good neighbor, just be someone who listens and inquires. Suddenly, multi-faith is so easy. You just ask, how is it going? What's important to you today? Let the conversation go normally. When I moved to Regina seven years ago, I had, was reading all these books, and it seems like in all these books, the authors always had a rabbi in their life. So the moment I got to Regina, one of the first calls I wanted to make was to the local rabbi, Rabbi Jeremy, who we've referenced here. He's our local rabbi and um, just a wonderful person. And it was the most awkward phone call I've ever made because I didn't plan out how it was going to go. It's like just dial up, get the secretary, and then it's like, Rabbi Jeremy, I'm like, oh, hi, um, I'm Sean, want to hang out? <laughs> and the rest of the conversation went better. But it was, uh, 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 Rabbi Jeremy's just been such a wonderful conversation partner in the whole thing. And he tends to collect quite a few Lutheran pastors. I think we all have a relationship with him. But, but, th but there's this sense of, the beginning of the multi-faith journey for me in that kind of that first intentional relationship. So what does it mean to be a person of faith in my context? It's literally in the job description of chaplain, or as another chaplain once said, the chaplain is the chaplain to the whole house. And so in a very real way, I need to be the chaplain for everybody, and I have to try and do that in the most open way possible. As my web page says about me, it says, I actually said it out loud and then quoted myself and wrote it into the web page. I am a completely non judgmental person. I'm not here to direct someone's journey. My role is to create space for reflection. This pause is important because it allows one to step back and examine their journey from a new perspective and assists in the ability to process what is being learned and, under, and to understand oneself a little better. My job is really to provide students with an opportunity to fully absorb and more deeply integrate their university learning and experience. Creating and holding space, trying to find ways to engage that conversation, learning again and again and again that I need to listen deeply before I try to say anything. It's being available to people in the hard times and being where they're at, not jumping to some easy conclusion. Mesa and I have commiserated a few times of being people somewhat youngish in the mosque or the church, and it's the same thing. Mesa shows up and they say, Mesa, you're here, a young person. Quick, where are all the youth? Can you, can you make the youth appear and come back to the mosque again? And, and, uh, and, and like a vision of the way that it used to be one day. I find so many parallels that are just so human in our human structure as we go along. So I open prayer vigils when tragedy and violence strikes around the world, and being a person of faith means being open to all of these ways of being human. If you had a chance to see my chapel up in the uh, second floor of Luther College there, um, you'll see that it's a bit of a potpourri of different expressions. And I keep inviting all the different faith groups on campus to come and use the space. There's a corner I have set aside with some prayer rugs there. And it, it's a, it's an, the idea is to allow all of the symbols to sort of clash and live together 
Because there's kind of two ways to do a multi-faith chapel. You can do sort of a bare room with a couple closets with all the holy hardware for the different traditions. You know, you just kind of pull out whatever you need for that moment, and then you put it back and hide it away. Or you can just let it all sit out there together. And one of my favorite moments was in the middle of a Tuesday chapel. We're sitting there doing our Lutheran Tuesday chapel thing, and somebody kind of walked in the back room and went over to the prayer corner, did their thing uh, in the prayer, and then kind of just waved and walked out. And we just did it in the same room, not trying to convert, change, or be anything to each other other than being neighbors. So the model I've kind of incorporated, as Brenda said, we have this uh, multi-faith peer chaplaincy. I've got some money to employ some students. And one of the things we say right away is we want to try to increase multi-faith fluency. And I love this phrase, multi-faith fluency, because it doesn't require me to be calm or to risk losing something of myself. I'm just learning a new language. I'm just learning a new way to, that other people express and are living out their faith or their not faith or their life and figuring these things out. Part of the model is to help students see themselves somewhere in the community. We have indigenous artwork up on the walls. We try to put these posters up. And sometimes I think the posters are more important than the actual events because it says, look, your identity, who you are, it is welcome here. There's a place where we can fit this in. A guiding question, what sort of Canada do you want to live in? One where you're anxious and fearful of your neighbor or one where you understand and respect and can call upon your neighbor in time of need. The multi-faith peer chaplains this year ran a, a thing called the soup group. Couldn't think of a better name. The soup group with these different themes and people would gather. And our one soup group was, what sort of head covering do you wear? And we had three young women come in and share from their Sikh, Jewish, and Muslim perspective. And we had 55 people turn out. It was almost like most of the Muslim Student Association and the Sikh Student Association showed up together with a small smattering of Christians in between. And they spoke from their different traditions. They spoke of hijab. They spoke of turban. And it was a wonderful, nice, surface-level sharing. And then we got to the conversation, and it got real. People were asking difficult questions to one another. The one young Sikh student was asking, I have a really difficult question. My grandma says that Muslims are, uh, she, was, she was Muslim asking a Sikh. My grandma says that Sikhs aren't allowed to eat halal meat, otherwise they, they lose their baptism. And there was a long, awkward pause. It's like, and then the one Sikh student's like, well, yes, technically that's true, but there's a context, there was a time, there was a bit of a fight back then, and, and, and they were able to have a difficult conversation about a difficult part of their practice of religion and move through it and be together and do that. There's so much richness in the relationships that you can find. I ran into somebody who was a very grumpy human being talking about, oh, my church is doing things I don't like, I had to leave, I went to this other place, and I'm never going to talk to these people. And I, I wasn't going to try and talk to them about the, any kind of issue, but what I felt at the moment is like, oh, you're missing out on so much. You're missing out on so much. The food alone at these different events <laughs> is, is worth attending. But then the relationship, the story, the breaking open of hearts, the humanity, it, it, it's just amazing. I thought Lutherans might have had a corner on the food thing, and then I started hanging out with some of the Sikhs, Wow, do the Sikhs do food well. This is just, this is the cornerstone of what it means to love your neighbor as a Sikh human being. So multi-faith, in that sense, is very easy. It's just being a good neighbor and trying to leave that salesman outside in the rain. It's when you find that right conversation partner and the honest conversation can happen. My team of multi-faith peer chaplains sort of obligate me to this, and so I've just been blessed. It's, it's something that is so worth the effort in your own context to find those conversation partners. And don't start on the hardest issue of the day. Don't go to, well, it says in Luther's document in uh, 1420, like don't go back to some really difficult, weird place. Start with, wow, you guys eat a lot of mint. Um, 
start with what does it mean to be here beside each other? What is it like? Why, why are there consistent parties at your house all the time? I had a neighbor, one neighbor on the one side come to me and say, I don't know about those people across the way there. They keep throwing parties every night. And uh, I don't know what's going on over there. And there's lots of children there. And, and it was Ramadan. Um, and it's just like, no, it's like they break the fast every day. It's, it's this beautiful expression. It's not some secret thing going on. I actually posted on Facebook once the secret life of Muslim women. One of my peer chaplains was posting about her weekend. And the secret life of Muslim women is mostly studying too much and cat cafes um, and, and getting out and being there. So here's what I've found. When religious traditions come together in conversation, learning takes place. First, we learn about the other by discovering our differences and some of our similarities. And second, we learn about ourselves. As a result of encountering the other faith and the other ideas, we gain insight into our own thinking, our own faith, and our own ways of being human before God. Thank you very much. I, I, I do want to thank you again uh, for being here. Uh, I guess as staff, there's an odd way in which this moment at convention begins back in January. I, I do know how Sean feels because it's sort of like, hi Mesa, hi Hannah, you want to be on my panel? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Brenda, thank you for your questions. I do find that it really like, deepens what it's about and brings it here. Uh, Mesa, there are multiple ways our church is trying to challenge each other to try things about how we gather and to uh, hear of your experiment, to say that interfaith space is safe space, uh, is helpful, and um, to ride through the, the ups and downs of who comes and who doesn't come. And thank you for that story. Hannah, I just want to honor your sheer honesty of what it meant to encounter something when you were six and when you were 23. Um, I think it was a little window into things that happen for all of us and how we think of church or the reason why we go through uh, to worship or prayer together. Uh, the, just by opening up yourself, it reminds us of the complexities and where the conversation might go. And Sean, you've certainly opened up a new way for us to give courage to have, open those phone calls. That's great. <laughs> uh, but, and perhaps the word fluency is the one that I take with me a little bit too, is what does it mean to become more fluent? So please join me in thanking them for being among us. We bless us by your presence. <laughs>